Okay, so let's get started with the session. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce Alberto Politi from the University of Southampton, who's going to talk to us about generation of non-classical light in silicon nitride devices. Over to you, Alberto. Okay. Um, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks to all the organizers for putting in the work uh, and bringing this conference uh, virtual. I know it has been a massive work, but um, it has been amazing so far. Uh, and hopefully you will enjoy uh, my talk as you enjoyed the talks before mine. Um, so um, today um, I, I decided to, um, to talk mainly about uh, squeezing generation in silicon nitride. So my uh, group in Southampton works on different topics, including silicon carbide color centers, mainly focusing on uh, the photonics there, silicon carbide also for um, infrared uh, or mid-infrared uh, emission, and silicon nitride as a way to generate single photons in the visible. And also we developed um, single photon detectors. Um, but again, today I will focus just on um, squeezing generation. I decided um, since no one will be seen, so you shouldn't be ashamed of uh, going asleep during my talk. Uh, you're not uh, like in the front room uh, or in the front seat at a conference. No one sees you if, uh, if you're going to snore a bit. Uh, so I decided I can go full, um, full technical and um, not seeing the consequences of it. So um, as you know, um, obviously a lot of you will work on uh, single photons, uh, but if you work with continuous variables, uh, you have a plethora of uh, different um, te uh, technologies that you can exploit. Uh, you can uh, uh, obviously use squeezing for uh, advanced sensing. You can use it for communication and uh, um, leading the, uh, the great work from uh, uh, Akira Furuzawa's group and others uh, also for um, full-blown quantum computing. Um, but if you uh, look at uh, the majority of uh, implementations of uh, CV um, quantum optics, uh, you will see uh, the typical picture of uh, uh, Akira's lab uh, that looks something like this. Uh, so it's a, a huge mess. And in some sense, uh, someone can ask, why um, the, the community hasn't gone to uh, integrated optics as much as uh, the community for um, uh, discrete uh, qubits has done in the last uh, 10 years or so. And uh, um, there has been a bit of, uh, of progress uh, in, in terms of uh, bringing some of uh, the components on chip. Um, for example, we did something similar again uh, in Bristol in collaboration with, uh, with Akira. But in some sense, uh, the main limitation is that uh, like with uh, um, single photons and qubits, uh, losses uh, are really kidding your experiment. So in a single qubit operation, you can work on post-selection at least for small scale and proof of principle demonstrations, uh, but losses kill your squeezing um, straight away and bring back uh, to the uh, classical coherent limit. So uh, the limitation here is not um, playing with, uh, with a squeeze state once you're, you're in chip and as we demonstrated in, in this paper, but really you want all the integration done uh, in, in the first go. So um, then you can imagine that the, the biggest limitation is, uh, is generating um, the non-classical state on chip, so for, for example, squeezing. And uh, this is the typical cavity uh, use, uh, using um, down conversion pumping strongly to, to achieve squeezing. And then you want your, your circuit and you want to, to detect um, all on chip. So there's been a lot of progress on uh, putting everything together in lithium niobate. Uh, uh, the group of uh, Mirko Lobino has done some amazing work uh, on here, putting um, squeezed uh, uh, sources and uh, some uh, optics on the same device. But uh, unfortunately, uh, with uh, Indiffuse waveguides, uh, the curves curvature radius is quite big, so integration um, is, is, is uh, somehow limited. So um, the preferred way for, for my group is, uh, is doing uh, everything a bit more integrated. So um, the best choice for, for my point of view is using silicon nitride. So there has been um, a lot of progress on, uh, on this topic using silicon nitride for quantum optics, um, both for uh, single photon generation of also squeezing. So there's been a similar work from, for um, to, to the one I'm going to show you uh, in a minute, also done from Sanadu and uh, Alex Gaeta's uh, group. Um, and, but uh, the reason why I like silicon lighter so much is that uh, I like silicon, you don't suffer from uh, two-photon absorption. And also it can be uh, easily integrated with uh, uh, detectors, especially 
um, photo detectors that are used for homodyne detection, like um, Jonathan Matthews has uh, shown in silicon. And since silicon nitride is also CMOS compatible, uh, you can imagine you can scale to, to big wafers uh, and so on. So uh, to generate squeezing uh, in silicon nitride, obviously you can't use the chitonal linearity as you would with a uh, um, lithium nitride or other bulk crystals, um, but you have to use the chitonal linearity. So this is very similar to uh, what has been done uh, in the 80s and the 90s in uh, optical fibers. So um, using the Caterino linearity, you have uh, um, cell phase modulation. So effectively, the refractive index depends on the intensity of your beam. And so if you think uh, in, uh, in phase space, uh, you have your current state uh, and the uh, high intensity component gets uh, a phase shift that is bigger uh, than the uh, low intensity components. And so you transform uh, your nice current state from a, a, a round circle into a squash uh, ellipse. And so um, you are generating squeezing in this way. So again, if you, if you go back um, uh, in the 80s and early 90s um, in optical fibers, uh, they, they uh, are all of these experiments where they were using long fibers in the order of uh, tens or two hundreds of meters uh, with uh, powerful uh, pass lasers to generate squeezing. They were creating a bit of noise and so they were using a uh, schematic that was looking something like this. So you were putting your uh, laser uh, into um, your carrier medium that was uh, optical fibers. Um, you were using an interferometer so that if the noise was created, it was going down the, um, uh, the bright port alongside with uh, uh, your pump. And uh, in the same um, generation, you were creating both uh, um, uh, squeezed pump state and also uh, squeeze vacuum state. So we, what we want to do is uh, following exactly the same schematic, uh, but replace um, the curve medium uh, from uh, uh, an optical fiber uh, to a silicon nitride device. So again, uh, if you look back, um, they were doing something like this, where instead of using uh, a Maxander interferometer, uh, you can use a Sagnac interferometer. Uh, and this simplifies uh, the um, experiment even further because you can use just one Kerr medium to generate squeezing rather than um, two Kerr media. So um, again, we want to swap the fiber as in, in this picture to a chip. Um, obviously, since we are on a chip, we can also um, do some integrated optics as well. Uh, we don't want just to use uh, a simple waveguide, uh, but rather we want to use a cavity to boost the nonlinearity. So instead of using um, past operation, we can also use uh, CW and reasonably small uh, powers. So um, the idea comes from um, the um, Anderson Group, so this um, often told uh, paper from uh, 2015. And uh, if you plug in the numbers for the simulation, you see that uh, changing the escape efficiency uh, from 50% to 90% with the parameters we get in the uh, usual silicon nitride devices, and uh, I will go through a bit more detail in a second, uh, you can generate some uh, decent amount of squeezing. So uh, if you generate if you increase the uh, escape efficiency, so the probability of the photons uh, or the squeezing being generated in the cavity to escape uh, the cavity, uh, you see that the squeezing generation goes up, but also uh, so in principle the, the power you, ne you need to use uh, to pump uh, your, your device. So we know roughly what we need. Uh, um, and uh, for silicon nitride, we use some startup fabrication process. Uh, so we deposit silicon nitride via, via PCVD, uh, like uh, the last talk uh, from, from Bristol. Um, but in our case, since we work at, uh, um, fifth, in the telecom range, uh, we add an, uh, a high temperature annealing step to drive out uh, the hydrogen impurity and decrease losses. So apart from this last step, this would be exactly the same uh, fabrication procedure that we used in the past for generating single photons at 800 nanometer uh, that was uh, fully CMOS compatible since PCVD is done uh, at uh, 350 uh, degrees. Um, and uh, this is the device uh, we, uh, we fabricated. So you see that we have um, the waveguide, the input waveguide. Uh, we have uh, um, 
multimodal interference uh, coupler uh, that splits the power 50-50 or very close to 50-50. You have counter-propagating light in the both, both directions that will couple to one of the rings, uh, hopefully generating squeezing. Uh, light will interfere the same um, uh, coupler. Uh, the bright uh, beam will go back uh, to the input port and uh, squeeze light will go out uh, and, and couple out. So um, these ring resonators have slightly different um, in-coupling efficiency, so uh, something similar to what I was showing before. And uh, if you look at the resonances, uh, we see that we have a loaded Q factor on the order of uh, 200,000. Since we are heavily overcoupled, this corresponds to um, intrinsic Q factors on the order of a million. Uh, but the ring is pretty small, it's on the order of uh, 30 microns radius, so the nonlinearity is, uh, is uh, pretty high. And uh, so the, um, the experiment would look something like this, where we have a tunable laser, we amplify it to the power we need, we couple in the chip uh, via a simple lens, um, hopefully we'll generate squeezing in the chip and go out, couple from the lens on the other side, and uh, we would need to do um, homodyne detection. Uh, but here, instead of uh, just bringing in a local oscillator and, and doing the scanning in the usual way, uh, we decided, well, uh, we don't want to keep stable the full experiments going on and off chip, so we can rather use a polarization trick. So what we do is, uh, since we use this uh, multimode interference uh, coupler, the uh, splitting ratio for the T mode, the one that we use for squeezing, is going to be different enough uh, from, for, from the uh, coupling efficiency for the TM mode, so that even if uh, most of the light um, for T will go back in the input port and squeezing go out in the output, for the TM mode, we'll, we'll have some light that goes also out from the output. And so we can use this uh, TM mode as our local oscillator. But since uh, both the squeeze beam and the local oscillator uh, have exactly the same path um, and the same mode, uh, they will share any phase fluctuation. And so we don't have to worry about phase stability. And then if we want to do um, uh, the homodyne measurement, we just have to do uh, polarization homodyne. So it's just a bunch of uh, uh, wave plates uh, polarizing the splitter and going to the um, two balance detectors uh, for, for that. Okay, so we, we do our experiment. We put in uh, on the order of uh, up to 50 milliwatts uh, of uh, light. And uh, uh, we were happy enough to see a bit of squeezing, uh, but um, this, uh, the squeezing appeared just at uh, very high frequencies. So on the order of uh, uh, 300 megahertz uh, and above. And instead, uh, for frequencies lower than 300, 400 megahertz, instead of seeing um, noise below uh, the short noise limit, we actually see noise above the short noise limit. So we increase the noise of our laser. Uh, so we scratched our head a bit, and then we were very lucky to find um, a paper from uh, Earl Betts uh, group um, on uh, opti optical fluctuations coming from uh, thermoreflective noise. So uh, effectively, this noise comes because uh, you have a waveguide or, or um, um, a piece of, uh, of material, and in any point of, uh, of your waveguide, you will have thermal fluctuations, and the thermal fluctuations depend uh, on uh, the temperature T. But uh, since the refractive index depends on temperature via the, uh, optic, sorry, the thermal optic coefficient, you will have that the refractive index uh, will change, and so the phase um, of the beam during propagation will change as well. And so um, you have uh, noise uh, whose pattern goes in this way, without going too much in detail, uh, just notice that, again, depends on uh, the fluctuations, so temperature squared, and depends on the uh, one over uh, the frequency squared. So we have a noise uh, that decays as the frequency squared, and we said, okay, can this explain the excess noise we see in our experiment? So first thing we did was, okay, how is the noise scaling with frequency? And we saw, yeah, it scales as one over F squared. So it's a good indication. Um, is it linear? Uh, and uh, yes, uh, we also saw uh, that the noise is linear with power. So it's not some nonlinear noise uh, that enters in, uh, in uh, the, the ring. 
Uh, and uh, finally, we uh, put the chip on our LTS cell and uh, we saw the excess noise was scaling with uh, temperature. And we also, um, again, big error bars, but certainly the noise is not temperature independence. And with, uh, I would say, good um, confidence, the, scale, the noise scales with the temperature squared. So all of these points are lead to the fact that the noise is coming from uh, these thermal fluctuations. Okay, so um, if that was the case, then we would expect some a bit more of noise from the, the simple uh, explanation I gave before. Uh, but you can break down the noise as coming from, okay, the waveguide, the ring, but also the Sanyak is doing something to the noise itself. Uh, and so we wanted to understand what's going on in the experiment. And uh, you can say, okay, what, what is the uh, noise generated in the ring? You can break down, sorry, in, in the waveguide, you can break down the waveguide as, uh, um, small components delta x, you integrate over the full length of your Sanyak uh, interferometer. Uh, you calculate that in some sense, since the noise um, is uh, correlated, uh, that is uh, the noise, the fluctuations in, in um, a point of the waveguide are the same thing from the palm going in the uh, clockwise and the anti-clockwise direction, you can calculate that most of the noise is filtered out um, by the uh, Sanyak interferometer. And the filter for the Sanyak is effectively a, a short pass filter. So the noise coming from the waveguide is already pretty small, uh, but you, when you also account for this filtering um, factor, you have that the noise is really, really, really negligible compared to the short noise level. There is uh, this blue line here. Okay, we would probably have expected that the noise contribution from the waveguide itself was small. Uh, what about the ring? Well, the ring also gets filtered out. In this case, uh, um, it would be even more filtered out if the ring was exactly at the center of uh, uh, the Sanyak interferometer. It's not because if you remember the picture I showed you, we have different rings. So it means that the ring where we are generating is not exactly in the back center of, uh, of the um, Sanyak. Uh, plus the ring obviously increases uh, the light matter interaction. So you have a component also for the thermal fluctuations, the scale uh, as the finesse uh, of, uh, of the ring resonator. So even if we start though uh, with um, a noise that is uh, um, quite well above uh, the short noise limit, this filtering given by the Sanyak reduces the noise below the short noise. So also this correlated noise coming from the fact that you counter-propagate in the two directions uh, is removed. Okay, you can imagine you have some noise from the laser in terms of uh, phase noise. We know that the, the, there is some phase noise from, uh, from our tunable laser, but the, the noise coming from the laser propagates in the two directions, so it's correlated uh, for the two um, clockwise and counterclockwise directions, so it's filtered out by uh, the Sanyak. Um, this time not by uh, these uh, short pass filters by just the rejection of the Sanyak. But also this noise is shared with the local oscillation. So, sorry, the local oscillator, so we wouldn't see that uh, anyway. And then remember that even if the noise is correlated uh, in, um, uh, in the Sanyak, um, this is still noise that is escaping from the Sanyak and is just reduced once again uh, by the rejection of the Sanyak. So the rejection, I just mean that I put in some power, the majority of the power comes back, but since we are not exactly 50-50 beam splitter, some of the uh, laser power escapes from the Sanyak and goes uh, with the um, squeeze state to the output. And since the rejection we have is on the order of 23 dB, uh, we expect a noise something like that. So we, we expect a few dB above uh, the short noise uh, for frequencies be above 100 megahertz. And this is more or less exactly what we see. So our model, it's not complete by any way, uh, but agrees pretty well uh, with uh, our experiment. Okay, so we are on one side happy uh, that we think we understand what's going on. On the other side, we say, well, we would see higher squeezing and possibly low, or low noise or no noise. Uh, how can we go in that direction? Well, we can do two things. Uh, one is, as I said, the noise scales with temperature. So if we ever want to, to do low temperature measurements, because for example, we want to couple to um, superconducting detectors, this will reduce uh, greatly uh, the, the noise. But even better, uh, since we think the majority of the noise is given by uh, the, the fact that the Sanyak interferometer is not perfect, if we replace our uh, MMI splitter with uh, something more complicated like a 
at your know, Mark Sander, like uh, um, guys in Bristol have, have done, uh, you can easily get to 60 dB rejection and again, uh, remove even more the noise from the chip. So if we remove completely the noise in our experiment, um, we would see on the order of 2 dB, 2 dB squeezing. Can we do better than that? And the answer is yes. Uh, if you decrease even more the losses and with uh, the beauty of silicon nitride is that you can go in principle to dB per meter. Um, if you do that, uh, for example, from uh, um, Alex Gaeta and uh, Michael Lipson uh, work, uh, this is the prediction from their results. You can get to more than 10 dB squeezing with powers on the order of tens of milliwatts. And even if you use uh, um, LPCD uh, deposited in, uh, in foundries, uh, you can get also uh, on the same order of noise with uh, hundreds of milliwatts. So we think um, these are a good way to proceed uh, and uh, there's a lot uh, to work in this direction to improve, to reduce noise and improve the squeezing. So I will uh, stop here uh, and uh, uh, thank you for listening. I also would like to point out that the majority of the uh, work done here is that was done by um, uh, Robert Chernaski, uh, PhD of mine, but now moved to uh, Australia. Great, thank you, Alberto. I don't know if uh, if you can hear me clapping or if you can uh, if you can hear me in the presentation, but um, I'm trying to clap on behalf of the. 200 odd people who've been uh, watching your talk there. Um, so I'll move on uh, to ask some of the questions quickly. Um, Jake Bulmer asks, is continuous wave squeezing compatible with CV quantum computing protocols? Um, it is, uh, obviously uh, you can, so here in C uh, CW just means that uh, at the moment we bought, we we pump CW, but in principle, you can also pump uh, pulsed. Um, the thing is, since we have a cavity, you will have a maximum frequency you can pass uh, the laser at, and that is given by the resonance uh, width. So with uh, our current factor and the way we're loading everything is going to be similar to the um, side best squeezing you see, so on the order of uh, gigahertz. Okay. Um, and then uh, the next question I can ask is from David Payne, who asks, was there anything stopping you from turning up the input power further to improve the squeezing? Um, no, you can uh, pump even more, but obviously also the noise uh, is going to increase in, uh, in, with the current device. Uh, so as I said before, the power, sorry, the noise is going to, to increase uh, linearly uh, with um, with power and uh, given that we don't have a lot of squeezing at the moment uh, there will be a point where effectively the noise will take over and just see uh, above some noise for any mm. frequency mm. okay great thank you um, that's all the time we've got for questions for now thank you alberto